Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories, and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. And we're back. How are you doing, Dora? I'm doing great. I'm excited about this one. It's kind of spontaneous, and I can't wait to see what you've got. Yeah, well, uh, shall we just jump into the topic I texted you about and said, let's I do a would, show? Let's <laughs> do it. Yeah, this is, I think, going to be an interesting one. Okay, so basically, I, I want to talk about, uh, this is going to have to do with Jesus, so I guess... <laughs> <laughs> it's a big one right now. It, religion seems to be going through something. I don't know. It's getting wild. Yeah. What are you, what are you hearing? Well, um, I'm taking a class with uh, Diana Heath, who was formerly known as Diana Walsh Pasulka. Um, hmm. do you, if you know about her, she's um, she wrote a book called American Cosmic. She's oh. really famous in the UFO community she's been on lots of podcasts you know and so it's um, diana i want to write it down Vasulka is what she's well known as um Vasulka with a diana walsh Vasulka. she now has a different um name but uh yeah no i was right american cosmic ufos religion technology was one of her big books that really just like that was published in 2019 mm -hmm. and um and she has a new one out called Encounters, Experiences with Non-Human Intelligences. But she's a, a religious uh, um, academic. Uh, so she's been teaching uh, theology and the history of religion for many years. That's her. That's what her PhD is in. It just um, she was really interested in the more exotic religious experiences that people have recorded throughout history. And that eventually got her into UFOs and uh, the phenomenon. Wow. Um, okay. So, so yeah, go ahead. So she's, uh, she offered this class that I saw came up on Twitter a few weeks ago, and it's called the hidden tradition women in early Christianity. And um, so I've been taking it. this class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, uh, showing that in very early Christianity, uh, women were bishops and priests and apostles and really empowered and respected. And that was um, systematically erased from history, rewritten and suppressed. Wow. And, uh, and so, I, I mean, I found that interesting because I had this, I had my own theory about um, the history of women in uh in religion because um i always found it odd the way christianity uh treats women how it sort of shoves them over says you can't be priest you have you can only be a nun right and it it makes them strangely subservient to men i i thought that was or i haven't I, i've recently been just thinking about that and seeing like why is that and you um, know something i learned recently is the the oldest bible in the world came out of africa it's ethiopian of course ethiopia i mean africa was right there right connected to the middle east mm -hmm. so it makes sense that these uh, biblical stories in the middle east would filter down through africa before coming into europe mm. so yeah the ethiopian bible is older than the European uh, King James Version. And the King James Version was really the result of some radical editing uh, about 300 AD through the councils of Nicaea at Constantinople, which was close to the 
I mean, Rome was collapsing, everything was falling. And, and uh, Emperor Constantine was, was kind of frantic to try to figure out how to gain control of the peasants, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the whole, um, they were pagans, they were pagans primarily. And then the religious uh, doctrines began coming in from Europe and, and, and he said, let's, you know, because Christianity was, was people were starting to follow Christianity as it was a, a teaching filtering into the pagan culture. So Constantine decided that he was going to take charge and rewrite the Bible, all these books that were coming in. And so he literally edited the whole thing. And that's our current version of the King James Version. So it was all edited at the councils of Nicaea. 300 AD by Emperor Constantine. Mm -hmm. So that's that's our little trivia. So now I'm very curious to see where it's gone now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she goes into um, during that editing process of the life and history of Jesus and creating the version of the Bible, the King James Bible. Through that process, they decided to ignore certain um, Gnostic texts um, yeah. that are called the Gnostic uh, um gospels and stuff and uh, they also changed the names there's a couple uh, there's at least one um like female apostle i think her name was junia or dunia that they renamed to a male name they just they just changed genders <laughs> and um a lot of art was def defaced um and even like eyes were gouged out of a female uh of women leading religious early christian ceremonies or beards were painted onto women to make them look like men in these early oh my god that's that's amazing yeah yeah and and so so i i asked a question yesterday the class was yesterday and one i was asking um you know because she was saying that rome was really patriarchal and they in rome uh the roman culture really did not like that early christianity had was empowering of women exactly and, yeah yeah and so, but she also made the point that Jesus was not just accepting and empowering of women. He was, he was accepting and empowering of all sorts of people that are normally cut out and considered not substandard humans. You know, the, his whole thing with the lepers and the poor and washing mm -hmm. the feet, it was, that was all radical, radically accepting of people that normally the, uh, the elite Roman culture, you know, you were either a citizen or a non-citizen, you know, there's like strict uh, groups of people. Yeah. So, so what I asked her was one, why was Roman culture so male dominant? Because I was under the impression if you had a pantheon of male and female gods, gods and goddesses, I would think that would lend itself to having male and female uh, leaders in the religious groups, you know, like maybe the, uh, the Athena group or the Aphrodite group would have naturally have more women or women empowered so i asked her if that first of all was did that make any sense um and then and but she said no that it, it doesn't show through history at all that cultures that have goddesses are any more nice to women or tolerant or empowering she mentioned in india and places you know they have all sorts of goddesses and they brutalize you know they brutalize yeah. women so so one she was like no totally naive uh, assumption i was making there so then I asked her, okay, why the heck was Jesus so empowering of women? If he was coming out of a culture of, uh, I mean, that was basically it. If, if the culture he was coming out of was super patriarchal, why was early Christian, or this is what I tried to ask her. Why was early Christianity so empowering of women? Was it connected to Jesus? Did, did he create that or was that something else? Did he actually teach things that led to the empowerment of women? And she was, she said, that's a really, that's like a big topic we're going to go more deeply into. But she said it was definitely connected to Jesus, that there's, um, there's stories and depictions of Jesus doing ceremonies, getting anointed by women, um, and having these religious events. Um, and also she had, there are texts that there were probably were some uh, female apostles that were um, just sort of deleted. Yeah. So, Okay, so that's that's one thread. So it was basically my revelation there was that Jesus really was different. He really, and 
and it just sort of like created this like seed in my brain of like why why was jesus different why was he more i mean um and it sort of just fascinates me that jesus you know like right now you have the entire media going crazy to try to demonize rfk jr and you know and also part of it trying to demonize one side trying to demonize trump and one side trying to demonize biden but it's amazing with Jesus being as controversial as he is through history that they have not succeeded in demonizing him. You can't, everyone on every side seems to admit that Jesus himself was nice and was, <laughs> and, and would talk about love, right? you know, but it's like, if, if he was so despised by so many different groups, you would think they would have done a better job of, uh, at, you know, really twisting what he was or about, but it's like everyone admits, yeah, he was a nice guy. It's just some people are like, he was just a human hippie and others are like, he was God, but. Yeah. I think the worst they could accuse him of was disturbing the peace. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So this leads to um, my whole thing with ETs and extraterrestrials. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out, obviously, you know, I, I think aliens are real and they've been here for thousands of years. So I've been trying to figure out what are they, what have they been doing here? And it, it seems one thing that's come clear to me is it seems there's two groups, at least one that I think um, we, for this conversation, we'll just call the Orions. Um, but they might be the Orions and the alpha draconians, although those are two different star systems. But the, the impression I'm getting is that the Orions are, um, probably the reptilians or connected to the reptilians and they are more authoritarian, more militaristic, strong hierarchy, strict control. They are sort of like, they're very in touch with the uh, God of the old Testament. They are very much like the God of the old Testament. It's like, these are the rules. You violate the rules. You will be punished. I'm a, you know, they might be a noble. They might, there might be some form of justice there. They might, but anyways, that's that's the impression I'm yeah. getting about the Orion culture. Would, would you say that was the beginning of the Abrahamic, uh, you know, trio, <laughs> the the religions um, that well, when that seems, all started? It, it just seems like the Old Testament and that those uh, that type of teaching seems very Orion like. Okay, yeah, so. yeah, totally. And then there is the Pleiadians, which seem to be very possibly the same or connected to the Galactic Federation. But the Pleiadians are always described from encounters and from channelers as being very enlightened, peace-loving, about non-interference, allowing free will, and really very hippie, you know, love sort of focused. Yeah. And so th there seems to be these two groups. And, you know, if you just sort of say, okay, what if they've both been here? What if both have been attempting to influence human evolution and history? Maybe that's the simple explanation is maybe Jesus was a Pleiadian. Um, and that sort of just came to me like um, last night while I was meditating, you know, I was just like, I, you know, one, it just sort of like, it finally just came clear to me, Jesus may have been an alien either or strongly, strongly influenced by alien um, control. And it, but it might be just as simple as he was, he was an alien. He was a Pleiadian. Yeah. And he was trying to introduce the Pleiadian values of love and forgiveness and tolerance and acceptance to human culture. Um, so that was, that's sort of like the theory that I sort of started with on this thread yesterday. You know, what I have been trying to figure out is the, um, where do the Hindu gods fit into this? You know, Shiva mm. and Vishnu um, because in Hinduism, Shiva is is the one worshipped. He's he's the one that's sort of the dissolver of ego. You know, the the one that you know, if you can pass through Shiva, then you've made it to you know um, to to Nirvana or whatever. So, but and then there's then there's uh, Vishnu, which is the other god. And it's almost like, okay, now we're talking about Enki and Enlil, right? So it's it I'm trying to match these all up in my head that that Vishnu could be Enlil 
and uh, Noshiva would be Enlil and Vishnu would be Enki. Um, and the stories go that each of these had their, they would come to the earth and, and then be incarnated into what they called an avatar. And, uh, you know, there are books out about Jesus living in India and taking on those teachings. He even lived in, in uh, Egypt. There's books on this, his lost 12 years, you know, the, the lost 12 years of Jesus. Uh, he did all his training, supposedly, in uh, Egypt and went on to India. And he was declared an avatar. And, and then he came back to the Middle East. And it was just, you know, they weren't ready for it. <laughs> Let's put it lightly. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was considered an avatar. And I believe it would have been an avatar of Vishnu, which is right up there with Krishna. And uh, so, yeah, this is great tr trying to... Uh, put these pieces together i'd love to find out more yeah well i mean i realize it's a really simple lens to take a look at history is like okay maybe certain people were heavily influenced or literally were orions and maybe certain people or figures were pleiadians and you know the simple you know it's almost like one thing to look at is okay jesus and then you know the old testament sort of thing seems clearly a Orion versus Pleiadian sort of distinction. Yeah. But I did, I go, I went to chat GPT and another AI and I said, Hey, um, I, I basically described the whole thing. Let's assume aliens are real. The Orions and the Pleiadians both have been here thousands of years. Um, and this is the difference between their philosophies and cultures. I want you to, and I said, what human in history are your top 20 guesses for humans who were fully Orion or Pleiadian or controlled by one or the other and why. And so it, it gave me a quick list of uh, Orions. It was like, it was like, this is an interesting exercise. And so wow. here's my top 10 list for who were Orions in history. <laughs> and it goes Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, Cleopatra, Joseph Stalin, Ivan the Terrible, Henry the Eighth, Queen Isabella, one of Spain, Napoleon Bonaparte, Attila the Hun, and Adolf Hitler. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That is amazing. That's yeah. a, wow. Okay. And then, and then I asked it, okay, Pleiadians. And it's interesting. Chat GPT did not list Jesus um, on its list for some reason, but the other AI, Grok, when I had Grok and Llama three do it, it had Jesus as its number one. But the oh. Chat GPT first left Jesus out and then went number, this was its order, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, St. Francis of Assisi, Jane Goodall, Leonardo da Vinci, John Lennon, and Albert Einstein. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then I, and then I, I asked it, uh, what about Moses and Muhammad? And it was like, it was interesting because it says they both uh, displayed both uh, both influences. They seem to have some of both. You know, it said because um, it said Moses had for an Orion influence. Moses' leadership was marked by establishing strong set of laws, the Ten Commandments, leading a large group through a rigid structured societal change. But on the Pleiadian side, he also his mission was also one of liberation and bringing higher moral and ethical standards to its people, which could reflect Pleiadian values of enlightenment. And then it seemed a similar thing with Muhammad. It said Muhammad's Orion side, he was a political leader, a religious prophet, established and administratively structured a rapidly exp expanding religious community and state. His leadership involved military campaigns. But on the Pleiadian side, his teachings emphasized compassion, peace, and spiritual devotion uh, to uplift the moral and spiritual welfare of his community. So it was, it was interesting that it said, you know, Moses that and Muhammad is. are sort of a mix. They are. What are your feelings? What do you think? Do you have well, any opinion? I, I don't know as much about them. So my focus yeah. really has, you know, I, I said that was just sort of like a tangent, but I wanted to really focus in on the Jesus question. Yeah. Um, and so I have more on Jesus. Um, oh, so I did ask, uh, first of all, chat GPT, like, why didn't you mention Jesus? And it said uh, involving, including Jesus is definitely intriguing. And this is what it says. The Pleiadian, um, interpretation of Jesus or influence on Jesus is one, he clearly had teachings of love and peace. His core message 
messages revolve around unconditional love, forgiveness, and peace. And those are very much in line with the Pleiadian values. Um, but then it said on the Orion side, it says, while his teachings and life were predominantly aligned with Pleiadian attributes, and Orion influences um, could be seen in the establishment of the church and its hierarchical nature could be That's seen weird. as creating a structured, organized religion that has a global influence. So it says, while Jesus himself preached a message of love and inclusivity, the institutional church has at times exhibited hierarchical hierarchical and authoritative characteristics. That is very strange. I mean, the church didn't even form until hundreds of years after he died. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that chat GPT, I'm like, was Jesus either Pleiadian and Orion? And it says, well, clearly Jesus himself was very Pleiadian, but it literally but says the church but the is church. Orion. Yes. Is, but it's, it's kind of, this connects back to Pasolka who says the early Christianity was more Pleiadian. It was more, and then it became, it looked like maybe it became taken over by Orion influence and became this structured, rigid thing. Well, that, it was taken uh, over by Emperor Constantine. I mean, he mm -hmm. sure, he sure took it over, and that yeah. he was he was a Roman. I guess the Romans were Orions, right? <laughs> it seems so. It does. So okay, so then after yeah. this, I was like, all right, I want more data. And so, you know, I've been digging into remote viewing as we've been discussing a lot of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I said, I'm going to just do a deep dive in who has ever tried to remote view Jesus. And the Farsight Institute has some recent, um, has a recent uh, focus study they did on the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. That's the most recent remote viewing. Okay. But I also have one, I did a, a search on Google um, for anyone else that has ever tried to remote view uh, Jesus. And I found a bunch of like a bunch of, I found a thread on Reddit and a couple forums where they're discussing it and people have actually tried to do it. There's some interesting things said, um, hmm. uh, a, a variety of li just little snippets. Um, so without going into that, I'm going to just stick with um, there. Well, uh, Courtney Brown has two books he published. Um, one is called Cosmic Voyage and Cosmic Explorers. And in his first one, he has remote viewing sessions, two chapters that are remote viewing sessions where he talks to Jesus. And this is through Farsight. Donald. Well, this is the founder of Farsight, Courtney Brown. Courtney, this okay. was like in the books. This is before he's even started Farsight. This is where he first learned how to remote view. Oh, okay. And he had the target of uh, and he was working with some sort of teacher. And in his first session... That, and so when he's doing these uh, these first sessions, it's a blind target. He doesn't know Jesus is a target. It's just a coordinate. Mm -hmm. and his. Um, but the guy guiding him knows it is. And the, the guide, at this point, they had never tried to remote view a, a real historical being and talk to them. So this was new to both of them. And the, his teacher was actually hesitant to even put Jesus as a potential target for them to try. But in his first session, he he uh, he finds himself, he goes and he finds himself first sort of in this building. Um, but after he sort of goes through this this building with these people, I'm going to I'm going to read this to you. He says this is from Courtney Brent from the book. He says, yeah. hold on, something is happening. I'm now perceiving that the information of this entire session is coming from some being. I am moving in on the being now. Hmm. This seems to be a light being. He is somewhat translucent. He is wearing a gown, and his hair seems to be made of light. I'm getting the flavor of a spiritual presence. I'm I'm getting the sense this guy is Jesus. I'll put that down as a uh, interpretation of the signal line. Hmm. Calls it an AOL. I don't know what that means. I think it's a an interpretation. Mm -hmm. I'm also perceiving a good deal of love projected toward me from this fellow. Quote, this being seems to be telling me that the situation has been set up so that no physical solution can remedy the problem. The idea is to force humans out of their physical entrapment and thereby save the race. And then he says, at this point in the session, my monitor's voice changed perceptibly. He seemed a bit nervous and quickly called an end to the session. And I asked him what the target was. And after a pause, he said that was Jesus. And still, yeah. And his then his monitor says, um, 
I need to think about this. He basically says, I need to get off. They're doing it over the phone. And because he was really sort of freaked out by it, that it worked so well and wow. that it seemed to contact uh, Jesus <laughs> as it did. <laughs> um, so that was their first session um, where they first contacted Jesus. And then Courtney does it again. He does it on his own. And this time he targets, I think he targets Jesus because they had questions for Jesus. Yeah. Um, and so in his second session, let's see. Da -da -da -da. Okay. He and it seems like his second session, he first ends, he goes into like uh Galactic Federation headquarters, and then the there's like this guy in Galactic Federation headquarters that sort of look like Buddha. And the this Buddha guy directed him to enter his mind, and he did. He goes into his mind, and he's and upon entering his mind, he simultaneously entered into another dimension or realm. It was as if one dimension was behind the other. In this other place, I cued on the concept of guidance, since that was the cue that led my unconscious to reveal Jesus, uh, reveal the Jesus personality in the previous session. I then saw his face. Immediately after perceiving Jesus's face, I got the distinct sense that he was glad that I returned to see him alone in a solo session. And to obtain information from Jesus within the structure of the SRV protocols, I cued on the concept of human gray interactions. That's the human and the, the gray alien interactions. That was the mm -hmm. topic he was trying to ask Jesus about because he was really focused on the gray aliens at this point. Yeah. The response that I received was very clear and even authoritative. He said that there is no being that humans will interact with that is not of his design. He then stated that we are to help his children however they come to us. And uh, let's see. His children referring to the greys? He says, yeah. Well, I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. He's yeah. saying that basically all beings that humans interact with, every alien species, I would assume, are they are all of his design and that uh, he stated that we are to help his children however they come to us. That's he said, yeah. he said, I'll just read a bit more. He said, Jesus went on to say that we humans have free will and that we have the capabilities to sort out what to do with our interactions with the greys. However, I got the clear impression that our choices will determine much of our future. I then cued on the concept of human Martian interactions, and I got a response similar to that regarding the greys. Um, Are they yeah. on Mars? The greys on Mars? He, there's, there's a diff. According to him, there's different uh, aliens that are on Mars. Huh. There's a different group hmm. who, uh, they're according to these remote viewing sessions in this book, the Martian. Uh, world has been greatly damaged and they are really suffering and i think they're they want to or they are in the process of trying to live on earth um trying to move what's left of their society or they're waiting for the earth to be welcoming of them um that's the impression i got from this this book at this time and here we are trying to go to mars to terraform it <laughs> <laughs> we'll live there and they live here so what's your gut feeling about the Jesus uh, issue and, and what's happening right now in the world? Well, what I'm trying, what I was trying to do from all checking all these remote viewing sessions is I was trying to tell if Jesus seemed to be an alien, if he seemed to be just, um, if he just seemed to be a Pleiadian or, or a, a star seed or someone from the Galactic Federation that was trying to influence earth. But the way he comes off in these sessions with courtney brown comes off as a god has someone with like a super high level um look at the evolution of the universe literally seems to be he talks about god um as yeah. jesus talks about god like god is uh like the father well there's another let me there's another piece um, well, let me say first okay. that 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 would go with the, the Hindu um, thing that that Shiva and Vishnu are gods, and every once in a while, you know, thousands of years or whatever, 
they will come down to earth and take on an avatar. And that's that's kind of like putting on a glove so you can act, you know, what an avatar is. You saw the movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. And so that's kind of the way they see it, too, in, in Hinduism, as far as I understand. Yeah. Well, this, you're going to like this part. Okay. So at the end of his second book, Cosmic Explorers, there's a chapter 35 called With the Eyes of God. And this is what he says. He says, my experience, my experiences in consciousness have demonstrated to me, this is Courtney Brown, beyond a doubt that my soul is real and that the soul of every human being on the planet is equally real. Since one does not physically go to any place when remote viewing, obviously there is something else about us that is already at the target location, at all target locations. What other mechanism could possibly explain the ability to perceive something accurately without any physical connection? Is there any possible way to explain the phenomenon of remote viewing other than to accept fully the scientifically verified reality of the unbounded nature of human consciousness, a consciousness that does not depend on the human body for its existence? And he says, my remote viewing experiences have also led me to understand God differently. I no longer look to some distant heaven to find my father. I, I now understand the meaning of the words once told by a wise sage, God is within. Yeah. And so, and this is, this is the fun part. He goes, uh, he said, then at some point he did, did a remote viewing of, okay. <clears throat> this is what he's saying about the nature of, he was trying to remote view the beginning of, um, the universe. And he, he sees this vortex and he says, the vortex was alive. There was a sense of a huge consciousness. And as I extended my mind across this consciousness, I felt stretched like the skin of a balloon, although not uncomfortably so. It then became clear to me that this being was terribly alone and sad beyond measure. It had spent an eternity by itself, slowly evolving until it finally grew to a point at which it could end its pain. Then, in one sudden burst, I experienced this being's solution. The being essentially blew itself up or at least much of itself. And as I followed the outward rush of the being's fragmenting expansion, I perceived that it experienced a new joy that nearly overwhelmed me. The being did not die. At first, the bits and pieces of the larger being were too small and immature to even be aware of themselves. Neither were they aware of their own origin. From this point uh, began the most profound evolution of the original being. It had become apparent to the fragments of itself. The fragmented parts began to experience existence in a way that seemed independent of the parent. Initially, they did not understand that they were literally part of a single larger being. Yet, as they continued to grow in experience, they matured and developed an intense need to know how they came to exist and indeed the reason for this existence. And so, and he says that the last end is, the parent had created a way to look back at itself through a mirror of a multitude of individual consciousnesses. So that's what he it's and that's like very similar to a lot of a lot of I'm sure that reminds you of a lot of different descriptions of, you know, the universe is uh, like God figuring out a way to experience itself. Absolutely. I mean, there again, in, in Hinduism, we have the Supreme Brahm, which is the universe, and they describe it as coming and going out of dream state. It goes into dream state and then comes out and then. I don't know. They've got it all figured out. <laughs> yeah. So it makes sense to me. And then I look at what's going on in quantum physics is also it all ties together. Um, the, the form of a toroidal field, it looks like a donut, right? And if you try to mark out every space on that entire donut inside and out and call each one of those dots an experience, you know, so you've got now trillions of experiences. And in in the Eastern philosophies, what we do as a consciousness is we we just go in and out, around and around and around, in through the middle, out and around and in and out. And these are our reincarnations going around and around, having all of the experiences. So it's like every time we come out and we're born and we go into a new life, we go continue on this path of experiences 
And the idea is, you know, by the time we get all the way around and if we, we've experienced everything and now we understand and we're wise and we love the whole game, then suddenly we are enlightened when we see the whole picture. But the idea being is everything is happening now. Everything exists in this moment. It's all right here. The only question is what experiencing, what, what is, what is your experience in this moment? And uh, it's a great, I love these philosophies. Um, and you can see in, in, in quantum physics, the toroidal field is, is somehow related to this zero point energy. It just keeps going. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, mm. big subject. But yeah, religion is going through kind of a re, uh, re-questioning of its identity right now. Do, do you see that happening? Yeah, well... It seems everything is going through a re-questioning. Um, That's true. Yeah, and you know, and then I guess it, you know, if we to, I guess to go back to the Jesus thread, it, um, well, if you if you then go to Farsight's most recent uh, studies, it's done on the crucifixion. It does these; they do these remote viewing sessions on the, the crucifixion of Jesus, and according to when they do those remote viewing sessions, what they see is that the that they see they identify two different people one that was crucified and one that is somehow actually the historical jesus and they're not the same person and they've courtney brown's interpretation of this is that jesus was going around teaching and he was i guess he courtney brown does sort of see he may have been an extraterrestrial but he was not actually crucified that some other a follower was convinced they were the Messiah and they were crucified. That's that's a Courtney Brown's interpretation. But but I rewatched uh, Yemi Janae's session on the crucifixion, and the thing that she and she did two targets. What she does is one the historical Jesus at the moment of crucifixion, wherever that historical Jesus was, and then the person who was crucified is the second target and what they're going through and when every one of their remote viewers do this, they identify two different people. Wow. The historical Jesus was not at the crucifixion at the moment of crucifixion. And the person crucified was it, you know, there was someone crucified. And wow. so he interprets that one way. But when I went back and, and watched and listened to Yemi Janae's session, mm. the person that she felt and experienced during the moment of crucifixion that was not being crucified did not come off as Pleiadian came off as a bit aggressive and stern, came off more Orion, did not come off like Jesus comes off in these remote viewing sessions of Courtney Brown. And the person- So, so let me was, be clear now. You, you're saying that that what they were picking up as the, the one that was being set as crucified and the one that we have written about in the Bible was not Jesus. The, what they, what, what, Courtney Brown interprets all of his remote viewing data, the multiple times that he's had people do the crucifixion, is that the person that was crucified was different than the historical Jesus that we talk about. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And he thinks it was, you know, I mean, and he reasons it would be very easy back then. It's not like the Romans would know what Jesus looked like. So if they came and said, we're going to arrest Jesus, and they, if Jesus, if Judas was actually Jesus is, sec, you know, firsthand guy, and they had agreed to have someone else be crucified in Jesus's place because he knew it had to happen, and maybe he saw it would be a symbolic, powerful thing, and maybe they even planned to have Jesus resurrect. It'd be much easier if Jesus didn't actually get killed. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, um, but you know, if you look at it, um, well, I mean, there's another possibility, is. I guess this is going to be, this might sound, um, you know, if the entire church, if early Christianity and the Catholic church actually was taken over by Orions um, after Jesus left the scene, then maybe, um, maybe when he says to his viewers to do, maybe the Catholic, maybe this whole Orion based church has a there is a different uh being who's also named jesus maybe there's two jesuses maybe there is one that was a pleiadian that maybe and that 
person was crucified, but the Catholic Church, you know, would have has a there's another being also named Jesus. That is, they use as their focal point, maybe who also was alive back then, and who is not who is stern and who is and so maybe they were picking up two different targets. The maybe the Orions have a person or a being named Jesus, and the Pleiadians have a person named Jesus, and they are they are different. One is Orion, one is Pleiadian. Does that make any sense? It does, but what I'm going to say is what I'm picking up intuitively is that the original Jesus was probably Pleiadian, but, you know, and that went well with the, the entire pagan culture at the time. But when the Romans were trying to save Rome from falling, they were desperate and had to recreate the identity of Jesus in order to regain control of, of that part of Rome. And, uh, and that, that's, that's when they had to make the image of Jesus different. Yeah. I mean, there's well, documentaries about it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I definitely sense that. I mean, the Catholic church and, and the Roman Catholic church, they, um, well, the problem, the problem with founding an entire church and trying to make it your authoritarian militaristic control structure if everyone that you're teaching in that church keeps on invoking a real Pleiadian, uh, yeah, peace Jesus, and love, yeah, right? it would be a problem. It would be a constant problem. They'd be pulling because yeah. if you know if this remote viewing and this sort of psychic energy stuff really works, you wouldn't want, you know, it'd be a problem if the people in your church are constantly pulling in this being of love when you're trying to control them with this militaristic hierarchy. So, but it could help you if you just had somebody else named Jesus. <laughs> You know, I mean, it could be anyone. It could just be like, we have to have someone else named Jesus because it would, that way we could help cancel out their telepathic invocation of the Pleiadian Jesus, you know, because we'd constantly right. say, you know, and maybe that's why they renamed him because his real name wasn't, his name wasn't Jesus back then. It was like Yeshua or something. Uh, uh -huh. So maybe, you know, maybe that's actually what helps them uh, deflect the telepathic call to the real Pleiadian who was crucified is they actually have someone else who's named Jesus and they say you contact and call on Jesus, you know, constantly call on this who is possibly another being. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you can't have a peace love hippie guy, you know, in a, in a warring environment like the Romans were. So they had to recreate it because he was yeah. the one with the power at that time. It was kind of sweeping across Europe, you know, and they had to get things under control. So they they recreated the story in their image. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it, it makes me wonder, I mean, if we just go with this premise, if yeah. let's say Jesus really was a Pleiadian and he really was teaching love and peace, whether or not he was crucified, doesn't really matter. He was he was teaching something that was fundamentally different than this the old testament religion, which was super Orion, super militaristic and authoritarian. You know, and then he leaves the scene and the Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church take it over and they totally turn it into something more Orion. Yeah. Why, you know, why would the Pleiadians go to the trouble of sending a Pleiadian Jesus to start this movement and not go to the trouble of having enough Pleiadians here to keep the institution from getting corrupted? Why would they come you know, just put a seed of something and then leave and let this, you know, corrupt, you know, institution get built. You know, why wouldn't they take the time to stay around? You know, like yeah. same thing with Buddha, you know, why would cause it seem like the Buddhist uh, religion, the same thing happened as soon as Buddha died. My understanding is, you know, it just quickly, it, it, it fractured into multiple schools and it became, you know, it's sort of a similar sort of thing happened, not quite as bad as the Catholic church. I don't know. Is that your impression? Yeah. Or? Yeah. And that's kind of the, the Hindu thing is that every so many thousands of years, an avatar is born. And the reason is it, it tries to pull the energy back into the Dharma, which is right life, you know, the, the, the love and the, you know, whatever it's, it's where harmony and balance is. So because we have a tendency to stray and get, you know, all off balance. So every once in a while, we need somebody who's a lot wiser to come in and put us back on track. And I think that's what it is. But yeah, each time we're put back on track, 
we end up falling off again. And so but why would they leave? Why would they go to the trouble of putting us back on track and not stick around to keep us on track? It, and so yeah. my theory is there is a physical reason that they have to leave. Maybe it's because that's when Nibiru leaves. You know, oh, maybe they yeah, come back be. every time Nibiru is close enough. They like, okay, let's go and try to introduce more peace and love, but they yeah. don't want to actually <laughs> stay 6, here. Every 6,000 years. Yep. Yeah. Every 6,000 years, every 6, <laughs> years, they, you know, they get close enough that they can come and spend a good hundred years here. But then it's like, they don't want to live here in this, you know. All right. We got to get back <laughs> on the ship. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because their planet really is this utopian, wonderful place. And I don't know, maybe that's what's going on right now. Um, maybe be. the bureau is getting be. closer and well, I do feel like we're we're in some phase of spiritual evolution you know it's like we're kind of now that we have technologies and all kinds of information you know boy oh boy information galore everywhere uh we're really discovering ourselves our nature who we are where we came from it's it's quite a journey um hopefully we'll find some answers this, that's yeah. what the disclosure is all about. So we got to keep making noise. Yeah. Well, there's lots of uh, threads of people saying that uh, something is just going to happen. Like the there, there's this one guy who I, who channels and he's um, maybe I can pull him up on Friday. It's a brief session, but he says that right now he got a message. I believe it was from the Pleiadians saying that on Venus, there is a big um, that the, the, the Indians or the Galactic Federation is um, in a bit of a war right now on Venus, but they are planning on very soon actually like making contact with the leaders of Earth. And um, there's others, other channelers who said that, you know, by 2028, 20, 2030, they are, they're literally going to land on like the White House lawn. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so maybe we're building up to something like that, some sort of like indisputable here are the aliens. They are here, and humanity has to now face its true history of what the aliens, you know, what the maybe the Orions and the reptilians have been doing through our history, and what some humans have been doing secretly. And it's gonna be if that is all, if it's all true, what seems to have been happening behind the scenes with the, you know, with the assassination of JFK and RFK, and possibly some shenanigans with 9-11 maybe even with covid it may be all tied to the same you know efforts of the new world order and the bilderberg group and the world economic forum to try to create a one world government um, i feel like if they're if they're if they've been trying to prepare us you know for this great disclosure i think they've done a great job because i feel ready for anything <laughs> I mean, just, yeah. okay, let's finally see what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get the feeling on, on X, it's just like, you know, and even with the classes I'm taking, you know, on this new ufology or, or, you know, master's program in ET studies, it's like every, there is definitely a huge amount of people who are just like, we want to know the truth. We are trying, and they're sorting out pieces. It's like, just like even this thread that, okay, it seems there's Orions and there's Pleiadians. It seems this is crystallizing as as it seems to be uh and it seems to fit you know it seems to be a lens to help understand history so what do you what do you think about the orions and the pleiadians could that be uh enlil and enki i mean could these be the anunnaki or you know and then and then we've got the shiva and vishnu what do good you think? question I, that's yeah. i mean i have not i mean are the anunnaki some say that word, the Anunnaki, just the word means those from space, you know, or heavens came down. And they say it could mean any species of alien. I don't know. But um, do you think the Orions and the Pleiadians might have been the Anunnaki that we hear about? I don't know. I think, mm -hmm. I think after, you know, now that I've like done this like deep dive into Jesus, I think the next focus will be the pyramids because it seems there, you know, both Elizabeth April and Farsight have done some, um, and, and others have really, there seems to be so much we can learn from like the pyramids and the great pyramid of Giza. And there's a bunch of people that have done remote viewing of the pyramids being built, or at least Farsight has and uh, Elizabeth April have. And I can, 
if you compare their notes, it seems from what I remember that um, it seems like someone like the Orions were really in charge of building the pyramids with that's what I've slaves. heard. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly that, what I've heard that they were the engineers. Yeah. Yeah. And that it, and there's also this incredible evidence that the pyramid of Giza was um, a type of power generator. There's like all sorts mm -hmm. of fascinating stuff about that seem to make sense of how it's engineered, but there then seems to be a point that someone like the galactic federation appears and forces them to stop openly enslaving humanity and I think forces the reptilians to go underground and to only influence humanity in an indirect way, but they can't get them to leave because they felt, you know, the reptilians or the Orions felt they had as much right to this planet as humans. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it could be something like that. The Orions might've been here first. Um, and with maybe they even helped create humans, evolved us to be slaves. And then the, the Adians came and maybe they come back every 6,000 or 3,000 years. Yeah. Um, and they try to like uh, influence things. In a I'm certain ready way. for anything. <laughs> I just, yeah. just, just want to know. Yeah. Me yeah. too. Wow. So, so, um, so what are we going to do now? Now we just, we, I mean, I just come back to meditation, you know, living mm -hmm. in this kind of floating anxiety of, I don't know what's going on is uh, uncomfortable. So I, I think meditation is the way to go. I, I totally agree. So, so we do a closing meditation for today. Let's do it. All right. Yeah. Um, let me get my, okay. All right. Let's take a nice breath. And feeling our feet on the floor, wiggle our toes, feel our feet surrounded by socks or shoes or whatever's there, just tuning in. Just tuning in to where we are, what's surrounding us, and what's coming in through the senses. Just checking with pressure, temperature, other sensations on the skin, cold, hot. And then we have sounds. Background noise sometimes is so part of our mind we don't even notice it maybe there's a fan or a motor tuning in see if we can feeling feel our body expanding and contracting with our breath what else is there Can you feel your eyeballs moving around in your head, your tongue in your mouth? See, whenever you get confused about what's going on in the world, you can always feel your feet on the floor. You can always take another breath. So let's sit for a few, let's say one minute, and just feel whatever there is. how your mind can generate thoughts like the mouth generates saliva it just happens and if we just see it then we can bring our consciousness back to the moment and when the mind is very Agitated, we can use an anchor, which is like a mantra, 
Breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. And check in where your energy is on a scale from one to 10, one being incredibly frightened and worried or depressed and angry, all the way up to 10, feeling excited, loving, embracing, open. Where are you in that skill? Anxious, calm, and just acknowledging the quality of our energy right now. No judgment. And this is right where we are in our experience in this moment. And we can open our eyes and come back to our show. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora, once again. I'll see you Friday. Okay. Have a good one. You too.